Good morning, afternoon, evening. Welcome to another edition of the best DFS show that just happens to start around 8 Eastern Standard Time. My name is Rob Diamond, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter, Sir Robert Six on all the main sites. And welcome to another RotoPros.com breakdown of the EPL Slate 4. Well, today is Friday, December 14th, 2018. But uh, the EPL Slate will be on December 15th, Saturday, 2018. So that's what I'll be talking about here today. And um, obviously, I just want to jump right into it. I don't want to waste too much time. I'm going to be covering the DraftKings main slate uh, for tomorrow and uh, there's a lot to talk about honestly. I think there's going to be a lot of really sneaky plays. Um, when we look at the slate as a whole, it's basically just a spur slate. So by all means, um, this is a, a slate where we can either choose to go for a simple fade in many cases uh, or we may, wa- may want to just uh, download uh, all the spurs that you can into your card. So let's uh, jump right into the slate here. Make it a little bit bigger. <clears throat> there we go. So yeah, let's start off right away with uh, Leicester and Crystal Palace. So um, yeah, I think there is going to be a fair amount uh, of this slate to uh, have in terms of draw edges. In terms of Leicester and Crystal Palace, there's probably not going to be a winner this slate uh, from this game. Excuse me, in this slate, and I think a lot of people will be expecting a Leicester City win. And the fact is that both of these teams have been drawing at a rate that's just astronomical, borderline. I would call it either, even uh, Southampton-esque drawing. So uh, it's something to consider here immediately before we really get too deep into the slate that uh, this is a Leicester City team that's coming in fairly I shouldn't say fairly uh, injured uh, like Palace is, but they're in pretty poor form. Uh, they've only won two of their previous nine games, and they have uh, they have scored in nine straight EPL away games, which uh, I think uh, gives a lot of warrant to uh, some actual uh, conceding on both sides here because, yeah, Palace isn't much better, especially without Zaha. You can really expect them not to do very much. and uh, They've only scored 12, or I should say, uh, there's only been 12 goals at Crystal Palace house this season at Selhurst Park so right away we're, we're kind of looking at a really low scoring game now one of the big issues for me obviously in the slate is uh, looking at the keepers now instantly one of my my rules always is uh, for low scoring games you can generally jump on a keeper and uh, you won't be risking too much of a blowout but both these keepers aren't very good uh, but in particular I'll be looking a little bit at Wayne Hansey it's, it's really hard to ignore Wayne Hansey on any slate as a GPP option he always stands as a GPP option. Um, now, I stress that because you'll notice uh, his floor can be pretty dr- dramatically bad, uh, but the same time his ceiling uh, can pop up and really take flight uh, he is someone who very consistently and very easily can make five saves obviously it hasn't happened uh, very often this uh, season uh, early in the season it was much more frequent but for only 4.9k you're really not asking too much in a low scoring game now a lot of this has to do with how Leicester are going to approach this game and if Jamie Vardy comes back for a full 90 minutes now the big issue with Leicester this season is mainly around their minutes and more importantly subbing off maybe majorly, uh, I shouldn't say majorly, major role players in their team uh, constructing uh, cards around losing minutes is generally a good way to lose money. So in many ways, while Leicester may be really good options, it's like going up against Crystal Palace, one of the worst teams in the league. Uh, a lot of their DFS relevance may in many ways be hindered by the fact that they're not going to play 90 minutes, and they rarely do play. Uh, especially uh, around uh, Jamie Vardy, who's missed the last excuse me, past few games, and while he may return to start this slate, there's no guarantee that he'll start or that he'll last a full 90 minutes. So it's something that, like, uh, it's, it's a little bit more risk where I don't think you need to take that kind of risk this slate. There's lots of different options across the board where you really don't have to uh, take a guy that's probably not going to be playing the, the full game. Uh, now, James Masson may be a slight exception to the rule here where uh, I'll probably dip into a little bit of Masson in both cash and GPP. He's just been through the roof in terms of production. Um, now, I know he does have uh, goals and two uh, two of those games there, but I'll still take uh, double digits this slate uh, with a little bit of a uh, ownership edge. Basically, anything outside of a Spurs ownership this slate is an ownership edge because so many people will be on Spurs. So uh, in a lot of cases, whenever people take Harry Kane or Son or Erickson or those three or even uh, Mora, depends, Lucas Mora, depends who starts, um, you really can't afford James Mass in 8.6K. So <clears throat> do I think... Um, 
he necessarily has like a slate breaking ceiling uh the rest of the slate would really have to crap out in order for madison to win the slate for you now is he is he going to be good yeah he'll be fine it's just he, he isn't like the best play of the slate uh especially from 8.6k so um in terms of Palliser, it may be Townsend if you want. Like he's been consistent enough, but there's no ceiling in this game. And when you start getting into the AK range, you really do need a ceiling. Uh, just a floor isn't going to cut it in either format because a lot of the AK guys in cash that you are taking have an implied ceiling that you can kind of jump on board with and justify that AK price tag. Where Palace just does not have it. Period. Um, now, does that say that? Uh, Townsend hasn't crossed the ball enough to be cash relevant absolutely not he's totally cash relevant in the sense that he checks all the boxes except for the major ones that is he plays in Crystal Palace and there's not really a ceiling from the game nor from his team so um, very likely a 1-1 uh, draw in this game if anything it would go 2-1 Leicester maybe 3-1 if they get a penalty shot free kick kind of goal I meant to I meant to mention one thing earlier in the the video here already I forgot um, basically this slate weather is a huge huge factor across the board every single game we're looking at extremely high winds rain and snow uh, sometimes all three uh, either rain and wind or snow and wind so. In particular, uh, I'll just rip through them now. Uh, get it out of the way. Uh, that way, uh, we I won't have to keep going back and forth to this. But Leicester and uh, Crystal Palace should have one of the windier games of the slate. Uh, they aren't expecting too much precipitation, but in terms of wind, it's going to be directly on the back of teams going uh, one end to the other, which is actually a massively big deal. Uh, when you're playing into the wind, you you basically have to keep the ball on the ground. You can't kick the ball in the air because it's too windy and it just floats and the other team can usually chew on it or intercept it. So in many cases, uh, what's going to happen here is that uh, there's going to be a lot, uh, a lot less long balls, and we'll we'll get to that later. Uh, it's not necessarily. Uh, as big a deal for some teams, but it is for a team like Leicester who rely very heavily on the counterattack. So those springing type passes that would send Jamie Vardy off on the counter aren't going to be as likely to go through because those long balls that are needed will generally die in the air and fall way short of the necessary length in the pass to, to execute it. So a lot of times, too, what happens is whenever they have wind at their half, they're more or back. They're more likely to shoot. Uh, they're more likely to uh, score goals, obviously, and they're more likely to not have to defend because the ball just generally easily goes in that direction. So uh, it's just something to consider here. But in terms of uh, the the Leicester pa the Leicester Palace game, uh, we are going to have a really strong wind in the back, and it's going to be just barely above freezing literally across the whole board again the manchester united liverpool game is going to be uh, the warmest really of saturday uh but uh yeah in terms of i'll just rip through them uh brighton and chelsea is going to be incredibly windy as well uh most of these games not only is it going to be incredibly incredibly windy but in uh the brighton chelsea uh leicester crystal palace uh fulham west ham and the Manchester City Everton game, the winds all increase for the second half. Wait, I think that Manchester City Everton's uh, off this slate. Sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned that. My bad. Uh, but yeah, in terms of um, the really windy ones, it's definitely going to be the Crystal Palace, Leicester, Brighton, Chelsea. Uh, Fulham, West Ham isn't going to be as windy. Uh, Huddersfield Newcastle is going to be quite windy but it's expected to calm down and a lot of the wind in the Huddersfield Newcastle and the Liverpool Manchester United game the next day and the Manchester City Everton is going to be quite windy but coming uh, on a nice curl for right foot shooters uh, which will really help if there's any right footed set piece takers in this game you really want to consider them because those are the type of shots that whip properly with the wind where if it's a left foot shooter what happens is that the curl actually goes into the wind so it slows down a lot of the curl and a lot of the power that would be normally found in the type of shot so um immediately matt ritchie is someone that comes to my mind here for newcastle is a borderline must play we'll get to him later uh but 
Uh, the Watford uh, Cardiff game isn't supposed to be very windy, but again, lots of rain and wind. Uh, excuse me, rain and snow. Um, and the uh, Wolverhampton Bournemouth game is easily going to be the most weather impacted game of the slate. Easily the most windy, um, and a lot of precipitation is supposed to be falling, both snow and rain. Um, it's supposed to get uh, a little bit less windy and less nasty as the game goes on. Uh, but it's another uh, right foot curl. So, again, uh, looking at guys like Junior Stanislas and Ryan Frazier as uh, two guys that could really stand out from the weather. So, I meant to I meant to bring that up earlier. Sorry, I completely forgot. The uh, Burnley-Tottenham, there's no wind really, but it's uh, on the back as well. Uh, so that's just uh, a few things to consider. But definitely uh, we'll be talking a lot this late about the Wolves-Bournemouth game. And uh, with a question already, it is easily the most weather-impacted game of the slate. So yeah, I just wanted to bring that into play uh, rather quickly. Sorry. Uh, but uh, jumping right back into this, I'll say a 2-1 Leicester uh, just to be relevant. But by all definition, this game should end in a draw. They're, they've both drawn the majority of their recent games. So th there's not enough skill uh, if we consider that Leicester are taking their players off. There's not enough skill from Palace to really go with someone other than Townsend and you're kind of really hoping for a ceiling. Or on Leicester, there isn't really enough minutes to go around and you can kind of go with Madison and hope he gets a 90-minute game and Jamie Vardy ends up switching with a forward and Mark Albrighton ends up coming off early and screwing a lot of people too. So that's really where I'm looking at this game. There isn't really much else outside of it. We'll say 2-1 Leicester, 1-1 drop. Next game on the slate, we have Newcastle traveling to Huddersfield. Uh, this is another really boring garbage game, um, especially when we consider basically since the start of last season, these have been the two worst teams in the league. No teams have lost more games uh, than Huddersfield and Newcastle. I think Huddersfield has uh, lost more than Newcastle. So, yeah, um, especially uh, when uh, we consider recent form too. DeBracco was on a really great stretch there, but he's really dropped down uh, as of late. And now you can't really uh, blame him necessarily um, in some of these instances, but just in terms as, as uh, DFS relevance, he probably isn't going to see enough saves this late to really offset any kind of uh, goal he may concede, which would be really unlikely. Huddersfield have scored in three straight home games, but like uh, they still don't have a, a goal from a striker at home this season they only have one win uh at home this season so yeah it's just not a lot to go with them really and uh when you take a look at someone like losel too um yeah, it's like there just isn't a lot of DFS relevance here. Uh, obviously, he has shown a ceiling, but so is Debracka. And if anything, Debracka is not only on a better team, but an arguably better goaltender. And uh, this is the issue again, like last game. I'm expecting another really low scoring game, but there's no real standout winner. Uh, I think you can go with Newcastle, but. That win isn't really something I'm looking to target in my keeper. Um, I I think it's, a, again, very likely both teams are going to concede here. Both teams are going to score. Newcastle's probably going to score more than once. I think it's really highly likely Newcastle scores more than once, but probably not more than twice. So it'll, be, it'll come down to whether or not Huddersfield can score more than once, and I really don't think they will, especially uh, without Aaron Moy. Uh, now, what that really does is, in many ways, makes Chris Lowe one of the cash locks of the slate. Now, one of my issues with Harry Kane this slate is that both of the defenders that you really should be taking this slate in cash are incredibly expensive. Um, and what that in many ways does is unless you're really willing to punt the rest of the field, um, y you can't really afford Harry Kane, unfortunately. So uh, that's really where the decision comes to the slate for me. And uh, I, like I said, Chris Lowe is someone that you're really going to need without Aaron Moy. He's going to have basic, basically uh, exclusive set pieces rights. Uh, 6.1K is a big price tag, but whenever we look at the other uh, defensive options this slate, there really isn't very much. And a lot of that can, again, be said about Matt Ritchie. I think he makes for one of the better plays this slate. Um, is he my absolute favorite? 
he's definitely up there. I wouldn't recommend him as like the absolute top play, but from only 7K against Huddersfield uh, in the weather game where the wind will be properly on his back both halves. That's the thing uh, to, to remember is that uh, in the one half when the wind is on his back, it will be carrying the ball, and in the wind when he's facing it, it will be properly whipping the ball in for crosses uh, for people like Ronda to just chew all over them. So it's just something to consider. I really like Matt Ritchie this late. I wouldn't force people to take him like I will some other plays this late where it's like an absolute must play. Um, but uh, I definitely might like, like Matt Ritchie for cash. It's tough to say how they're going to approach this, especially without John Joe Shelby. But I'd probably just stick with Matt Ritchie. Again, the issue, Kennedy and Ritchie kind of split duties a little bit. And it all depends really on what side of the uh, field the kick ends up being on. And while I definitely like Ritchie a lot more, uh, history and just basic relevance in this game, um, they both deserve warrant and uh i would definitely prefer candy and gpp and uh, matt ritchie in cash uh and in terms of forwards there's really nothing to look at on either side of the field here a lot of that has to do with the fact that rondon uh, doesn't really play 90 minute games now i will hand it to him he has been uh scoring uh and putting up points uh and putting up lots of shots so he has shown some relevance um but the minutes concern me still, and Huddersfield isn't really a team to get drawn out of position like most other teams will. Here's how Newcastle plays. Basically, Newcastle sits way back, lets teams come, basically forces the team to make an awkward pass that allows Newcastle's really huge defenders to intercept the pass. And then they very, very, very quickly overpass the midfield, jump over with the pass, and uh, go immediately to Rondon up front. And he takes it down, he holds on to the ball, and he lets the play develop around him. And what ends up happening is that he lays it off to certain people, usually the wingers like Richie or Kennedy. And then Rondon will make this, what's called a check run, and he'll take the ball, he'll lay it off, and he'll do kind of like a Nike check mark. And then he, what that actually does is it draws the defender completely out of position and allows allows Rondon to break away for a header, which will eventually come. Now, Rondon isn't the most fleet of foot, but uh, he is like 6'4", 225 pounds. So, you know, you give and you take a little bit. And in a lot of cases, what ends up happening is that uh, defenders can't take the ball off from, from when he takes the ball down, lays it off, and then when he makes the check run, basically that run initiates a situation where the defender either has to go with Rondon, and if he doesn't go with Rondon, Rondon's going to be open for another pass, or if he goes with Rondon, it's going to open up space that he just left, allowing either Rondon or another player to run in. And that's just the basic premise for forward in soccer. So in terms of what Rondon does, this game it could be really good with the weather considered. It's just the issue is that Huddersfield doesn't really get drawn out very much they aren't a team to really lose position and shape they're very structured very much like brighton so um it's tough to see newcastle getting a lot of execution from their crosses but i definitely see a lot of crosses coming in from matt ritchie i think it's a definite uh, another safe uh double digits cross game for matt ritchie uh, so yeah, that's just, uh, sorry, I wanted to get my Newcastle explanation out of the way because it is incredibly relevant whenever we're considering the weather and that teams just aren't going to be able to pass the ball because in the half when Newcastle doesn't have the ball, they're not going to be able to kick the ball up to run it because in any time they try and do so, what will end up happening is that the ball will die in the air and it won't make it all the way to run. And usually the highest field midfielders will be able to jump in there. And without Aaron Moy, uh, they're going to be playing a lot more defensive than they normally would. There, that's my that's my rant. Uh, I'm gonna say two nothing Newcastle, uh, but uh, Debraca doesn't see any saves at all. Uh, he sees no shots on net. That's my that's my uh, bold call, I guess you could say. But uh, a more realistic call would be another one one draw, uh, maybe a two one win either way. Uh, probably like I said, the Newcastle way. And unlike uh, unlike. Um, but Madison, excuse me, uh, from eight points, uh, whatever, eight point six k. Matt Ritchie can absolutely do well enough from only seven k in the same kind of two goal script. He doesn't need the rest of the slate to crap out in order to still do well because you know he's still going to have eight to ten crosses and whatever else he might manage to do. So yeah. Um, Let's say 3-1 Newcastle, just to give it a little bit of GPP upside, because I do think there is some there. Uh, so yeah, 3-1 Newcastle. Let's move on to the next one. The big one. Burnley is traveling to Spurs. Now, 
Fortunately, there's no real two ways about it. Like Burnley are just really bad. Hashtag bad. Um, and the, there's no reason not to target them every single game, basically. Now, um, especially away from home. At home, it's a little bit of a different situation. But away from home, there just isn't enough to really go with here. Now, uh, obviously, there's some save counts that are really impressive. But at the same time, uh, there's some that are, are devastating low. And whenever he hits those low, it gets really bad now. Um, I wanted to try and find a relevant game there. I won't. Uh, I'll just keep moving on here. So basically for this one, if you were watching the midweek, I'll get my midweek rant out of the way first. Spurs qualified. Um, and I don't think it was any skill of their own that they managed to do that. Inner dropped the ball as is. So it really didn't matter what Spurs did. But in terms of Barcelona basically handed this one to Spurs. Um, it, Messi didn't start at all. Uh, they really came out with like a seaside. Uh, there were multiple min salary options on Barcelona. <clears throat> Excuse me. I shouldn't say multiple. Uh, Car Carlos Alina was the real one that uh, was around 13 to 15% owned in both formats just because he was min salary on Barcelona. So like there were definitely some some leaks to the Barcelona lineup, which allowed Spurs to basically get through in a 1-1 draw. But more importantly, in the grand scheme of things, Barcelona didn't want Inter to get through for multiple reasons. Whether it was Mario Accardi, Leo Messi, uh, their feud, you can check that out online. Just do a quick Google search of uh, Accardi, Messi, national team. And it, you'll learn everything you need to know about how Messi has bestly basically kept him off of the past couple World Cup teams for Argentina, despite Accardi being easily the high goal scorer in Europe for three or four seasons now. Uh, or uh, for other reasons, like Spurs are just an enormously inferior side when compared to a side like Inter and the challenges Inter present to a team like Barcelona. It, they're just much better off with Inter out of this tournament. Uh, so I think a lot of that had to do a lot more with Spurs getting through. And yeah, I'm a biased homer hater of Spurs, but that's just the fact with the situation. I could call, bring out all sorts of random opinions like how I think uh, Spurs got lucky and things like that, which is a relevant argument, but they definitely earned their last few uh, results. So uh, despite Barcelona kind of hands them, Spurs did still have to score and play. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, really my midweek take there. Uh, kind of ties into this because we really don't know how Spurs are going to come at this slate. They may rest some more people. They may play some more people. Kyle Walker-Peters, I know, again, it was Barcelona, but uh, he had absolutely no hope in hell of uh, doing anything. Now, I have to give props out to Spurs, though. Mad love for keeping them on for the 61-minute mark. They obviously know what DFS is about, so you have to respect them for that. And on top of that, Spurs hasn't drawn a game yet this season. So that means there's always a result for either side of the field. And that's a, that's really huge in DFS because it gives relevance to literally the entire the entire team, whether the goaltender getting the win or the forwards or the out players having to score goals in order to win games. So, yeah, I think this is... Um, Tough call on Kyle Walker Peters. 5.5K is not not what uh, I, I uh, consider really relevant. I wasn't that impressed last slate uh, to really warrant that much salary, but there's a really good chance without uh, Trippier and Aurier, he is going to get the, the 90 minute game. Hopefully, not 90 minutes, but um, he'll probably get the start. Now, in terms of the midfield, again, like Sons are really would have been an excellent option if he uh, wasn't 9.5K. And, like, you're almost better off going with Erickson in that situation. Now, uh, it, it, this is totally up in the air in terms of who they start. Now, obviously, we want lower the better. But, again, the main issue here is, like, there's nothing to say. Well, there's lots to say Harry Kane's probably going to play 90 minutes unless Lorente comes on for him, which is also very possible. Uh, Deli Ali, Lamea, Erickson, Son, Lucas Moore, they all deserve 90 minutes. So if they start, there's a really good chance they're coming off. And I know Spurs can only use three subs, but good luck guessing what three it will be. So unless there's some really solid news ahead of time, that doesn't necessarily lend to the fact that Spurs will do bad or play worse, 
but it does lend to the fact that it just gives us another out to the idea of fading Spurs or not taking Spurs in GPP uh, just because their minutes could all be eaten away by random subs and then the one guy that stays on for the full game doesn't do anything. So it's just something to consider. It's not necessarily my recommendation this late. If this was last season, it would be a completely different story. Burnley used to come into London and just terrorize teams on the road, especially Spurs. Uh, so this season, they're just too bad. Uh, their minutes are too uh, unreliable and inconsistent and while their floors are okay there's just nothing really to find here against Spurs like it's not like they're gonna find really a relevant floor or ceiling uh so yeah I know like a lot of people love whenever Charlie Taylor gets down here because he's kind of like the Hadagajong again uh but uh yeah against Spurs I'm really just not too geared into this at all um I guess you could get away with them if, like, you really Loten and uh, Loten or Charlie Taylor, excuse me, if you really want to punt the defender. Uh, but it, yeah, I think there's just better options like spending up on defender, for example. Now, one thing to consider here is if uh, Johan Ber- Berg Goodmanson doesn't go, uh, Robbie Brady's probably someone you're going to want in your cash exposures this slate. Uh, now, obviously, this was kind of a, a random outlier game. I wouldn't look too deeply into that, but he still did get his six fantasy points, which is really all you need from 5.3K. You're, you're not asking the world. And especially a lot of his lower scores tend to come whenever he's splitting with Johan Berg Goodmanson. If, if JBG isn't even on the bench, get Robbie Brady into uh, your cash cards this slate. Absolutely lockable from only 5.3K. Uh, he's going to cross the ball eight, eight times, even against Spurs. So, yeah, I have absolutely no problem with that. Uh, you know what, even in either format, I think you can get away with 8 to 10 fantasy points with him this slate uh, just to kind of keep up the floor. Because uh, I, I like... I like the balance cards this slate a lot. I think, uh, especially if you're looking at uh, taking a, a, spear, a Spurs list uh, route or to like less Spurs in your cards, uh, the balance cards are really neat this slate because you can chalk your cards full of six to eight K guys that are all super super viable and uh, still have tons of options left over. Where all you really need is like ten to fifteen fantasy points from everyone and have one of them go really well. And that's the kind of floor plays that we're looking at this slate from Matt Ritchie. Like, he probably isn't going to get you 24, but there's a really good chance he's going to get you 10 to 15. Same with Chris Lowe. Uh, he may not get you 10 to 15, but he's definitely going to get you double-digit crossings. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I have uh, a little bit less love for Spurs, but uh, in terms of uh Burnley, Robbie Brady is basically where I would be looking at this slate. Now, again, a lot of this has to do with how Spurs line up, how they start, how their subs are looking. They may even leave some guys straight off the bench. Uh, So you can play Harry Kane. It isn't the worst idea in the world. But already you're starting to see that we're game stacking a little bit here. And it's almost already turning into like a GPP comeback stack both ways. I still think at this point right now where we stand, this is still cash viable. And especially whenever we get a little bit deeper in here. Uh, So, yeah. um, I'll say it... it Well, Spurs are going to need at least three goals from their salaries. Can Spurs score that many from their salaries? Yes. Okay, then you can take Spurs. Uh, Will they be able to do it from 90-minute games? Yes, then you absolutely must need lockable Spurs. You have to. Burnley are just that bad. But, like... I wouldn't talk you out of taking some 90-minute Burnley players, uh, like one of their wingbacks and Robbie Brady. Uh, The problem with the Burnley forwards is their minutes are some of the worst in the league, uh, if not the worst in the league. So, yeah, it's just really not something that I'm looking to jump on board with when there's so many other viable options Uh that uh, you can take, uh, obviously not in uh, the same price range, but with way more floor and way more upside and way more consistent minutes. So there's just no reason to jump on board with that to me. I'll say th- uh, 3 nothing Spurs, uh, maybe 3-1 if you want to think they'll concede and ruin the clean sheet. Uh, but I really don't see Burnley scoring more than once. I don't see Spurs scoring less than twice, but no more than three times. Uh, it's still... 
making them cash viable but not quite gpp there's i think there's a little bit of edge there maybe i'm just convincing myself uh because i want that edge to be there i will definitely admit that but uh I, i'm quite convinced there should be an ownership edge to be found on a slate that just has spurs uh but yeah don't don't fade them just no matter what don't completely fade them i think that's a, a bad idea like cross your entire exposures if you want it, like a lot of uh the rules and gpp for ownership is going whatever the field's going to be uh or whatever you think the field's going to be and then going either above or below that uh and trying to catch an edge either, either way you, you really don't want to completely fade them in this situation so i will say uh two two one three one spurs uh just to keep it interesting Next game of the slate, we have my personal favorite game of the slate. And what I think uh, we're getting into is some really goal-heavy end of the slate here. Uh, we have uh, Cardiff traveling to Watford. Now, uh, Cardiff's one of the worst, if not the worst, away team in the league. It's not even close. So I think across the board, we can definitely take a look at different options. Uh, now, Cardiff aren't completely inept offensively, and they do stand a chance to concede much higher, especially when we consider the unlikely that Huddersfield field would or crystal palace or even Leicester might not uh it's all comparable right so it, or even burnley not scoring so um i think cardiff does stand a good chance but at the same time watford's defensive stack is just ultra viable uh all the time so yeah i have uh, no problem with going a uh, whole boss especially whole boss and cash uh this is what i was referencing earlier him and low you're you're probably going to want both of them in your cash cards uh just because of their double digit crossing upside and the absolute lack of that in the defender core of this slate especially when we consider the top three defenders probably aren't even going to top three salary defenders probably aren't even going to play um it definitely opens up some space there where uh you're you're going to need whole boss because there one isn't a lot of other options and there just isn't options uh high end or just in general so yeah um i definitely like the whole boss low you can jump on foster it isn't my favorite keeper play of the slate uh like for gpp i would even much prefer going with one of the lower scoring games like even losel or hennessy i think are both better gp plays than foster uh just because the low scoring nature of the games because these next three games should all be quite high scoring, so I, I'm a little bit less, uh, I'm a little bit more hesitant, excuse me, to start jumping on board with keepers. But uh, whole boss, you, you're definitely going to need. And probably my favorite uh, GPP play this slate is uh, Roberto Pereira uh, from Watford, only 6.6k. Uh, I, I think absolute standing value, probably a steal of a discount. When we consider the weather, he's on the right side of the wind. Um, I know there's going to be a lot, but he's on the right side. 6.6K is just not a big ask against Cardiff at all, especially when you consider 90 minutes from the position he plays. Now, obviously, I prefer Holobos and Cash uh, and Pereira and GPP, but that isn't to take away from the fact that Pereira still has a half-decent floor going up against a team like Cardiff. So uh, definitely not my favorite Cash play in Pereira. Holobos is probably one of my favorite Cash plays. Uh, but uh, conversely, I definitely wouldn't take Holobos in GPP. Uh, he has way too too many negative EV scripts, whether it's fouls, cards, conceding. There's just too much stacked against him from that salary of 6.5K uh, when you can easily find a ceiling from 6.5K from lots of different options. Candy comes to mind. Instead, I think he's 6.6K. So, yeah, um, that's just something to think about there. But, uh, uh, yeah, prayer is definitely someone you're going to want to watch. You're going to want to watch and uh, get involved with the GPP this slate. Uh, I'll definitely be going over the field on Roberto Prayer, which probably won't be that hard, anyways. Uh, but uh, in terms of the rest of this game, there isn't really a whole lot to like uh, in terms of minutes or Cardiff. Um, I, I do like the idea of Del Fleu. Uh, it's just his minutes have been so atrociously bad. It's not worth it and pr makes prayer totally worth it. Uh, you could even jump on someone like Camarasa and Cash. Uh, he's pumping in enough crosses and uh, set pieces. And uh, if you're unaware with the Watford style, basically they just love to foul and take cards and get suspended. So uh, it's never a bad idea to take a set pieces taker against uh, Watford or Everton. 
Uh, so I definitely don't dislike that this late. It's far from my favorite play. I'd much rather go even prayer and cash and seek a little bit of upside for roughly the same floor. Uh, obviously, Kimaras has a little bit better floor, but just no real upside on Cardiff. Uh, and like it, the conceding could come from somewhere, you know, Bobby Reed and uh, Pat again, Mance aren't great, but uh, Patterson is another really kind of viable GPP option for a goal. Uh, he's been playing really well as of late. And as you can see, he got the goal there last game against Southampton outside of his goal. He really doesn't do enough to warrant anything serious in uh, whether a major exposure or in cash, but uh, I definitely think he's worth a punt. And I also like decor and GPP as well as an interesting little punt uh, from only like 5.2 K. But um, yeah, in terms of this game, I really think it's going to be 3-2 Watford. Uh, maybe 2-1, uh, 2-0 Watford. I really I wouldn't mind seeing a Watford clean sheet, that's for sure. But I, I, I'm I finding it hard not to imagine a situation where both teams score don't score, excuse me. And uh, yeah, I do like... Uh, I do like the idea of a game stack here in GPP. I think it would be especially an interesting pivot off the Spurs' ownership uh, to jump into actually any three of these final games. Uh, so, yeah, I'll say uh, say 3 nothing Watford. 3-1. That's heavy. That's pretty heavy. It'll probably be a 1-1-2-1 one, one, one game. But, uh, yeah, I do like uh, Watford. Next game on the slate, we have Bournemouth traveling to Wolves. Uh, incredible game. Another excellent game that should absolutely shoot out uh do not look for keepers in this one just uh, exit the keepers here uh not a viable pick in either uh format for either team uh they're conceding at a rate uh, whether it's bournemouth away from home or uh, wolves just in general i uh, haven't been keeping the clean sheets enough uh and on top of that wolves never allow a lot of shots on net uh like five's basically the ceiling where you'll see games with a uh, hennessy with six to seven sometimes even de gay gets six to seven so yeah, there just isn't a whole lot to love here. And, like, I do like Bournemouth a lot, just not defensively. Uh, I, Bournemouth has had, I'll give it to them, out of their past, like, six games, they've played five of the top six teams in the league. So uh, it isn't really, like, the most ideal situation. But uh, I definitely uh, think that going forward uh, on either side, there's going to be some interesting options. Uh, without the clean sheet, I'm really not interested in either defensive for uh for uh, GPP and for cash, they really just don't have the floor comparable to go up against some of these other names. Uh, but like I mentioned earlier, Junior Stanislas is really interesting to me in GPP, uh, just with the wind on his back and taking some free kicks. And Ryan Frazier could be in a very similar situation. Uh, yeah, he he was on fire, uh, but yeah, pretty big salary jump. You know, because, uh, like, I'm not necessarily keen to play Ryan Frazier in cash, but I would definitely be keen to play Stanislas in GPP. And I think you can get away with Frazier in cash. It just isn't uh, the first place I'm looking this slate. And uh, if Callum Wilson doesn't play, I'm really not too interested in the uh, Bournemouth forwards either. I know that's kind of a risk as well, but, like, uh, it's tough to say because, like, lately – uh, Wolves have been turning it up in terms of attacking. Uh, they, they've they kind of abandoned their defense first mentality and have really been going for it. Uh, so I don't necessarily hate the idea of either of these teams in GPP. I think a game stack is absolutely viable. Uh, but if I'm going to be targeting Bournemouth, it's going to be the midfield. And if I'm going to be targeting Wolves, it's going to be the attack. Maybe that's a cue for everyone again like last slate and uh, the midweek uh, with uh, Cavani and I I finally got off him and I called it. Uh, maybe that's the time now to take uh, the Bournemouth attack and uh, jump on the Wolves. Now, um, yeah, it it's tough. Uh, I, I want to check something. Yeah, it, something tells me Wolves don't allow a lot of goals from outside the box. I can't remember if it's they don't allow a lot of goals outside the box or they allow a lot of goals outside the box. I'm pretty sure it's they don't, which would take away the shot upside for the Bournemouth guys, uh, which may incline a little bit more to Callum Wilson. Uh, but like 8.8K is just a little bit too much for me to stomach for someone who uh, isn't 100% healthy and could just as easily not start to come in uh, or be taken off. So, yeah, um, 
don't just don't look at the goalies in this one. That's basically it. Look at the uh, forwards in the midfields. Make sure to have decent exposure to both in GPP. In terms of cash, I don't really see much relevance from either team, uh, mainly because I think Frazier would be the main guy and he's way too expensive. And Wolves just isn't playing the same kind of crossing upside. They're more uh, passing dribbling. So um, I will say... 2-2 draw. Um, it's a 2-1 game late, and Wolves tie it really late. Uh, but uh, in terms of, yeah, just the main take from this game, uh, fade the goalies. Final game of the slate, we have West Ham traveling to Fulham in one of the ugliest yet more potential-based uh, late hammer games of the season. Again, this is a situation where you really don't want to target uh the, the defenders and goalies. Now, if you're unfamiliar with uh, the London structure of soccer teams, uh, Fulham West Ham are both from deep inside London. They're fairly big rivals. They definitely aren't each other's biggest rivals. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, location, uh, West Ham, Arsenal, Chelsea, and Fulham are all within a stone's throw of each other. Uh, so, yeah, uh, this is a pretty big rivalry. Uh, I expect it to be fairly high octane, high energy. Uh, in terms of the starters, it's really tough uh, because there's a ton of injuries and there's tons of guys here that you really do want uh, on, on your side. Uh, for example, Callum Wilson is absolutely cash viable to slate from only 4K. Um, if you've been playing Champions League for any length of time and you're familiar with uh, Rakitsky on Shakhtar, he's the center back in the same idea who takes some free kicks though, but they just have a really decent floor from their salary. So I have absolutely no problem with that uh, in either format really from 4K. I don't think you can go wrong whenever you're looking looking to save money and spend up. Just don't expect a massive ceiling. The only reason you're really taking Callum Chambers is to get between six to eight fantasy points. And maybe if a miracle happens, he'll get up to double digits. Uh, but yeah, in terms of, uh, I'd fade the goaltenders. Uh, yeah, Callum Chambers is probably where I'd keep it to the defensive exposure. Uh, depending on who you start, they start, excuse me, both teams, you can kind of look and peek and look at their wing backs. Uh, but that's the problem is that with the late hammer, you kind of have to have this prepared ahead of time. And uh, I think uh, in terms of GPP this slate, one of my favorites again to go with Pereira uh, would definitely be uh, Philippe Anderson. And probably one of my favorite stacks this slate is going to be Philippe Anderson uh, to either uh, Chikorito or uh, depending on who they start again. Because this is once again another situation where they're super... Uh, West Ham are just decimated by injuries across the board. Uh, I, I also think you can absolutely get away with playing some Fulham players. Uh, they're 100% viable too. Uh, they're getting a little bit more expensive than I would like, but in terms of RSS and uh, Schurler, you can get away with from 7.7K as well. But uh, I would probably start my focus on the West Ham side of things. Uh, Snodgrass' salary is starting to get up into the stratosphere of untouchable despite a really excellent cross count. Uh, if you were to take a full floor play of midfields to slate, uh, you would definitely want to, the two highest crossers in, um, in excuse me, in uh, Snodgrass and Robbie Brady. Where are you at, kid? Can't find you. Um, I know, see, a lot of the, this cash look right here is that um, they aren't the most popular, uh, but, uh, and I know they're both, I, yeah, they're, they're both my namesakes, but they both cross the ball, uh, enough, uh, where you can get away with them, uh, in cash from their salaries and a little bit of ownership upside on Snodgrass. Cause much like the other 8k people we talked about already, um, whenever you start selecting Spurs players or another 8k plus player, uh, once you get to the third or fourth guy you're picking, you usually can't afford Snodgrass anymore from that salary. So I don't mind that in either format for ownership or in cash for just simply floor. Uh, but uh, yeah, in terms of the final game, for me, a lot of this will be determined on who West Ham start up front. I will have Chikorito built in, uh, prepared, uh, but I'll also have some pivots around him as well just in case he doesn't start. Uh, because Andy Carroll could end up there too. He isn't someone I'm going to openly prepare for, uh, unlike Chikorito. Chikorito, interesting stat, he has uh, 49 career goals in the EPL. He's looking for his 50th. 
all of them have come inside the box. He's never scored outside the box before. So I think that's pretty funny, uh, pretty interesting. So see what happens here. But uh, uh, Chikorito's been playing excellent, uh, getting 90 minutes again. Uh, an absolute legend of his time. So it wouldn't surprise me to see him get uh, a a goal, if not multiple goals, this late. Uh, I definitely, I definitely support a Chikorito, uh, Philippe Anderson, and then jumping in on some Watford, uh, like uh, Pereira. Where are you at? Sorry, I, I know silence there. I'm just building. Uh, but yeah, like uh, you can even drop down and uh, take some Calm Chambers. Spend up if you want a goaltender because you definitely have the ability. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, now, I know there isn't a, a lot of forward options when we get down here. Uh, I do think Newcastle holds some interesting options and in guys like uh, Perez, if he starts, you can definitely get away with RSS and GPP. And much like the Bournemouth Wolves game, you can absolutely get away with the game stack in this game uh, with the Wolves and Fulham. So in, in many cases here, what you can really do is just take a bunch of these guys and uh, no matter who starts, you'll have a really decent pivot option. Uh now, I would definitely not recommend the defenses in GPP. If I was to take one or the other, it would probably be the West Ham defense. Uh, as Fulham haven't had a clean sheet yet this season, they basically don't have uh, a ceiling. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, I got to stop saying, ah, uh, sorry. West Ham are good enough to score more than two. Fulham are absolutely good enough to score more than once. So um, will that happen? I do think so, yes. I'm foreseeing a 2-2 draw between these two. Uh, absolute pounding of DFS goodness. Anyone who misses out in the late game will probably be pretty upset. Now, could it cancel out? Absolutely. Uh, neither team are necessarily talented, and West Ham are necessarily injured uh, without question. Uh, another guy I'm kind of flirting with the idea with is uh, Mark Noble. Uh, he takes the penalty shots for West Ham. And it wouldn't surprise me again to see Fulham take a penalty shot this game. It's not like they haven't already. So, yeah, um, I'll say 2-2. Two -two. I'm going to say 2-2. Two -two. I'm going for it. Uh, across the board, I think you can get on either side of this game. They're not expensive enough, and there should be multiple goals. Uh, Fabanski, the thing with Fabanski is that, yes, he, he is good. He makes lots of saves, but the fact that he makes the most saves in the league should draw indication to the fact that West Ham just allow way too many scoring chances to get away uh, unscathed away uh, on the road, too, mind you. So, yeah, I will say 2-2 uh, drop. So yeah, that is the uh, EPL schedule for this slate, uh, Saturday, December 15th, 2018. I am Rob Diamond, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter, Sir Robert Six and all the main sites. Rotopros.com, get over there, check us out, like, subscribe, comment. Thanks a lot for tuning in, everyone. Good luck this weekend. All the best, much love. See you later.